everyone. Welcome to the 2021 Research Showcase in May. Uh, my name is Martin Gallach. I'm a research scientist here at the Wikimedia, Fund the Wikimedia Foundation. Uh, I will... One second, I'm here myself. I'll be hosting today's showcase uh, where we want to take a deeper look at the importance and the value of Wikipedia outside of Wikipedia. I'm super excited and pleased to introduce today's speakers. Uh, first, we have Tiziano Piccardi from EPFL in Switzerland, where he's a PhD student in the data science lab, directed by a Wikimedia research fellow, Bob West. And he'll present a recent study on the value of Wikipedia's links to external website websites as a gateway to the web. In the second half, we'll have Nick Vincent from Northwestern University in the US. Uh, and there he's a PhD student in the People Spaces and Algorithms Research, Research Group, which is directed by Brent Hesht. And uh, Nick will talk about the importance of Wikipedia for search engines, such as Google Bing or DuckDuckGo. Uh, at the end of each talk, we'll have uh, hopefully 10, 10 minutes or more time for Q&A. So if you have questions, even during the talks uh, for the speakers, please put them in the chat or on IRC. We will relay them here in the room. My colleague Isaac Johnson will take care of that. And before we start with uh, Tiziano's talks, uh, Isaac has a few comments and introductory remarks about the general context of today's theme. Isaac, please. Thanks, Martin. Uh, yes, I'm Isaac Johnson. I'm a research scientist with the uh, Wikimedia Foundation. Um, I'm excited about today because it touches on some of my own research interests, uh, in particular two related and very important issues, the broader role that Wikimedia plays in our eco information ecosystems, uh, as well as the economic value that one can assign to Wikimedia because of this role. Um, I think the value is going to be clear from, from their work today. Uh, neither researchers are newcomers to this space. Um, and I don't want to steal too, steal too much thunder, but I did want to highlight a few things about why I think this research area is important. Um, so first, reuse of Wikimedia content. It's fundamental to the success of the projects. Uh, in order to reach all people, it's quite likely that many of that is going to happen off of Wikimedia's platform. And so it's important for us to understand this reuse because uh, when it breaks the connection with Wikipedia, Wikimedia, people can lose much of the context that's important for verifiability. Uh, we'll never see the edit button and so on. But at the same time, it does help us reach many more people. Um, and a large body of research has made clear how important awareness and peripheral participation through reading, even vandalism at times, uh, can become to people being editors. And then the second one, this question of the economic value of Wikimedia. I think it's one that few of us think about, but it's no less important. I um, mean, the reason it's important to put a number on the value that Wikimedia projects provide to the world is largely a question of policy. So when governments are considering laws to pass around narrow forms of content moderation or greater openness around image copyright, uh, companies often use their economic value to convince lawmakers of the importance of tuning laws to their needs. And so being able to point to estimates of Wikimedia's value makes it easier to explain why these policies should also consider alternative forms of community-driven content moderation or greater openness through freedom of panorama. And so that helps Wikimedia's greater mission, even if the number itself is purely abstract and I don't think uh, what motivates any of us to be here today. Um, and I'll just say one last thing. Uh, this area of research has been kind of historically overlooked in part because of the difficulty of obtaining data that connects Wikimedia to external platforms. Um, so I just wanna say we're, we're working on that challenge, trying to make open more data sets. Uh, and very recently we released an ongoing daily data set of Wikipedia traffic that comes to us uh, from search engines, split by search engine com company operating system and browser. Um, I'll share the link on IRC and YouTube, and hopefully in a few weeks, we'll have a kind of more gener general blog post to introduce this data set. Uh, but yeah, I just wanted to say, trying to trying to get more data out there for, for researchers to be able to take a look at and answer some of these bigger questions. Um, and with that, I will pass it on to Tiziana. Okay, thank you. Um, let me share my screen. 
Uh, can you see my screen? Okay, perfect. So th thank you very much. And um, first of all, uh, thank you for the invite and uh, I'm excited to present uh, this work. Um, and th this is um, a study on uh, um, uh, the value of Wikipedia as a gateway uh, to the web. And we investigated the role of Wikipedia in driving traffic to external websites. And as uh, Isaac said, uh, in a different dimension, informational and economic. Uh, this work is um, uh, in collaboration with Miriam Reddy of the uh, Wikimedia Foundation, uh, Giovanni Colavizza uh, from the University of, of Amsterdam, and uh, uh, Bob West, my advisor at uh, APFL. Um, first of all, we have to consider that Wikipedia, beyond being an encyclopedia, is a website uh, with links to uh, external web resources. And uh, reading an article and navigating to an external website is part of the regular experience of uh, the Wikipedia readers. Consider, for example, that only in the English uh, edition, uh, there are more than 60 million external links. And these links are distributed in uh, uh, three areas of the page. Uh, the first location uh, uh, where we can observe 2.8 uh, million external links uh, is the info box. That is, uh, as you know, a summary box with the key facts uh, about the entity described on the page. The second location is the body of the article where we can observe 25 million links. Uh, the body can have a link uh, in line with the text uh, or in the dedicated section, uh, uh, usually uh, named uh, external links or see also. And finally, we can observe uh, 35 million links in the reference section uh, where uh, we can find the source of the information available in the text. In uh, this study, uh, we quantify the engagement of the reader with uh, the different uh, type of links. And uh, then we focus our attention on official links uh, because they give a, a clear signal of the reader uh, interest uh, in the entity described in the article and potentially can provide um, economic value to the destination website. Um, so uh, let's see how to identify the official links. Uh, um, they are mainly in the info box uh, and uh, uh, they refer to the entity described uh, on the page and typically are in a, um, in a relation one-to-one -one, uh, with a Wikipedia article. One entity has one official link. Uh, but since it's not uh, um, um, being in the info box is not enough to qualify as an official link, uh, we implemented a classifier to basically um, um, detect uh, what is the official link of uh, one entity. Um, um, in this example, uh, um, the, there is the info box taken from the article about the Republic of Slovenia. And uh, there are two links uh, and uh, um, geolocation and uh, the institutional website or official link. And we want to classify the link uh, with the geo coordinates as a non official link. Uh, while uh, the, um, we want to classify the domain slovenia.si as an uh, official link. Uh, without going in technicalities, uh, that is not uh, um, the point of this talk, uh, um, we implemented a model in, by using a random forest, uh, using the features uh, in the page and uh, in the domain name. And we can uh, correctly uh, classify an official link with precision recall around 98%. So we run this classifier on uh, all the pages on Wikipedia, and we got uh, uh, almost a half a million official links uh, with their relative articles. So now the big question is, uh, uh, what is the role of Wikipedia in driving traffic to these uh, external websites? Uh, um, and as I said, we approach this question uh, um, of the value as a gateway uh, from two different angles, informational and economic. Uh, and in practice, uh, uh, we aim to answer uh, this uh, question uh, by exploring three directions. Uh, first, we want to quantify what is the level of engagement. Basically, if uh, this uh, official link uh, and links, uh, external links in general are used at all. Uh, second, we want uh, to explore what are the patterns that are associated with um, more or less click. And finally, we want to estimate the economic, uh, in economic term, uh, the traffic received through Wikipedia. 
To answer this question, uh, uh, we used data collected for four weeks in April uh, 2019, and uh, we developed a client-side instrumentation to capture different types of events and understand how the readers interact with the page. The data collected is limited uh, to the English uh, um, edition of Wikipedia, and uh, to preserve privacy of the reader, we drop all the sensitive information and included only anonymous users that in the case of uh, Wikipedia is the vast majority. Um, in total, we collected uh, 96 million events generated by different types of interaction with the page, uh, such as um, external click, uh, over pop-up, uh, and uh, jump to footnotes. And out of all these events, uh, uh, more than 43 million or 40% are uh, external clicks that bring the reader uh, to content out of Wikipedia. Um, now, with this data, uh, we are ready to approach uh, our first uh, question. What is the level of engagement with external links? Um, before answering this question, uh, we have to define what we mean by engagement. Uh, in our case, we look at engagement uh, from two perspectives, uh, click-to-rate and uh, click-speed. Uh, for the first metric, click-to-rate, uh, um, we use a standard definition of uh, click-to-rate um, that is defined as uh, the number of time a link was clicked divided by the number of time the, it was displayed. While th for the second metric, we measure the median time uh, passed from the load of the page and the click. Um, so by, by looking at the clicks in the different uh, areas of the page, uh, we, no we notice substantial differences. Um, for example, the uh, links in the info box have a highest level of engagement with a click to rate of 0.9% and a median uh, click speed of less than 19 seconds. Uh, the in the body, the average click to rate is 0.14 with a median of 35 seconds on the page before clicking the link. And finally, uh, the links interreferences have uh, a relative low level of engagement with a click to rate of 0.03% uh, and high uh, click time, meaning that people spend time reading uh, the content before clicking a reference. Um, what is interesting is that uh, when we focus on official links, uh, we notice a level of uh, interaction significantly higher uh, than uh, all the other links. In, uh, in total, uh, on uh, all the official links, uh, we observe 9.8 million clicks. And the average click through rate is 2.47. Or in other terms, when the official link is present, one in 40 page loads uh, show a click. So uh, now that uh, we know that official links are uh, actually used, uh, um, we want to understand what are the patterns of engagement with uh, these official links. And uh, uh, to understand if there are differences uh, in the engagement uh, based on the type of article, we used ORES uh, to assign topics. ORES, uh, uh, I guess you know uh, what it is, but it's, uh, uh, let's say, the standard topic classifier used by Wikipedia. And uh, um, a first look uh, highlights that um, um, links associated with uh, library and information, software uh, and internet, internet culture and uh, computing have uh, the highest uh, um, click-to rate, um, in average of 4%. Uh, and by inspecting uh, the popular links in, uh, in these topics, uh, we notice some article where the engagement is uh, significantly higher. Um, some examples uh, in, uh, in this uh, high click-to-rate uh, website include uh, Reddit, uh, Rotten Tomatoes, and some popular file sharing uh, um, website that have a high uh, click-to-rate up to 40% and median time of a few seconds. Uh, this suggests that some pages are uh, used simply as a stepping stone uh, from a search engine to the actual intended destination. In, in particular, in, particular uh, in the list of file sharing websites, uh, we see uh, many websites that are um, intended to bypass 
paywall of uh, scientific content. And, and uh, this uh, intuition is supported also by uh, an analysis of the um, um, HTTP referer uh, of the request uh, to, to understand if uh, there is a, this stepping stone aspect of Wikipedia. Um, for every page, um, we recorded um, where we record a click, we can observe where the reader came from. And in this plot on the y axis, we have the click to rate, and on the x axis, the frequency of external referer. One means that the totality of the user that click on the official link came from an external website, typically a search engine. And we notice on the right part of the plot, uh, this is a, an additional evidence of the stepping stone uh, nature of uh, some pages on Wikipedia. Uh, the articles that are rich uh, near, nearly exclusively uh, from search are the article uh, on which we see the highest click to rate. So there is this uh, nature of entering and leaving uh, in uh, one step. Um, so uh, at this point, uh, you could ask why would people go to Wikipedia in the first place uh, rather than uh, go directly uh, from search to the destination page. And uh, we uh, spent a bit of uh, time in manually inspecting and we found that often um, the, these websites are not indexed by search engine or downranked by search engines. And, um, and this is an indication that uh, Wikipedia fills uh, a gap in providing uh, a value for the user navigation when uh, the search engine cannot uh, provide it what they are looking for. So the, the, pre the previous result uh, give an overview on uh, the behavior that, uh, the, the, the behavior that uh, we can observe uh, in the data. Uh, but to understand if the topic truly has an impact on the click to rate, we design a match study. Um, since we know from other um, uh, studies that uh, click to rate uh, varies uh, from different level of um, article length and popularity, we control for these two variables to remove their effect. Um, we balance the data set with respect to uh, high and low click to rate by using the median as a threshold and the pairing article that minimizes these two variables, the popularity and the page length. And finally, with the resulting data set, uh, we train a logistic regression using a high or low click to rate as the target variable. And um, we train the model by uh, using the topics as feature and we rank each feature by its coefficient. And uh, the, the results show some uh, variation from the pre previous ob observation by controlling for uh, these two variables. Um, we have uh, um, business and economics, education and sport uh, that emerge uh, as the topic with the strongest association with high click to rate. On the other hand, uh, consist consistently with the previous finding, biography, geographical content, and television are the topics that receive uh, the least engagement on the official links. Um, we repeated uh, the same approach uh, by replacing as target variable the interaction speed. And uh, uh, we notice, uh, um, for example, that biography, geographical content, and history are associated with uh, slow click, while sport sport, radio, and, uh, and library information with fast click. In particular, library information is uh, the category that has uh, uh, this website that I was mentioning uh, about um, um, file sharing and uh, similar content. Uh, one uh, nice thing is that using these two these coefficients of the two regression, we can inspect in two dimensions the relation of each uh, topic uh, with an um, engagement in terms of volume and speed. For example, we can see uh, from this plot that sport uh, um, is associated with fast click and high click rate, and geographical content tends to have a low click to rate and slow click. So moving to uh, the next question, um, we can um, finally estimate uh, the economic value on uh, of this large uh, of uh, volume of traffic coming from Wikipedia. And uh, um, imp important thing, uh, it was ar already discussed uh, at the beginning from um, uh, Isaac and 
Wikipedia is a non-profit, uh, so um, we'll never charge uh, the, um, any cost for this click, but we can uh, uh, frame the question in a different way. Uh, we can ask uh, what would be the, um, the cost of this, this traffic if it was acquired through sponsor search. Um, and to approach, approach this question, we estimated uh, the value uh, by using uh, Google Ads, one of the most popular uh, provider of uh, sponsor traffic. And we proceed in two steps. Uh, by um, implementing a simple agent uh, that simulate uh, a promotional campaign. Um, first, uh, we used uh, the Google Keyword Planner to obtain a list of recommended uh, keywords. This tool uh, is offered by Google and it takes uh, in, um, in input uh, the address of a website to promote uh, and it generates a list of uh, recommended terms that uh, can be used uh, <clears throat> to trigger the um, exposition of the ad in the search result. Um, in this example, we give Coursera, that is a, as you know, a popular education website as input and we obtain uh, keywords like online courses, uh, learning uh, free and uh, online degrees. Then we take these uh, top uh, 10 keywords sorted by relevance um, uh, with uh, the title of the page and we simulate a campaign with uh, the forecasting tool. And uh, this tool uh, allows a campaign manager uh, to estimate the cost of a promotional campaign uh, by using historical data of uh, the Google users. Uh, this gives us a cost per click on the different keywords and uh, the expected number of clicks. So uh, using this, uh, we can aggregate uh, this uh, prediction to have an estimation of the average cost per click uh, for a campaign promoting this target website. Uh, we repeated uh, this process by simulating promotional campaigns for a random sam sample of uh, 3,600 website and uh, uh, by weighting the cost uh, for the respective number of clicks, we estimate uh, um, a cost per click between 73 cent or 1.37 dollars, depending if uh, uh, we use the median or the mean. Um, I, I want to add uh, um, one thing that uh, um, it's uh, not in the paper, uh, that we validated this, uh, um, this number with an additional analysis by also looking at the actual keyword that were used uh, in, um, to reach Wikipedia through search engine. Uh, so we uh, created a campaign targeting uh, the exact keywords uh, that were used uh, in, um, in, the, in the search engine. And uh, we reach uh, basically the same uh, um, estimation of the cost per click. So we are confident that uh, uh, at least this estimation is uh, it's, uh, quite accurate. So finally, by multiplying uh, the estimation by the total number of click received by the official links, that is uh, 9.8 uh, million, uh, we estimate the economic value uh, between seven and thirteen million dollar per month. Again, depending on the median or uh, the mean. Um, so this um, again, this is a virtual value. It's um, we are aware that it's an abstract estimation, and uh, but is it important uh, to put in um, um, this in perspective? Uh, because uh, it's, um, um, this is value that is given for free uh, from Wikipedia to the web ecosystem. And uh, if, you, um, if you consider uh, the um, uh, yearly donation to Wikipedia are uh, in the same uh, order uh, of magnitude. And, and this is only uh, the... Um, considering the clicks uh, that uh, are from uh, the English version of Wikipedia. So if we really consider the full uh, Wikipedia ecosystem, uh, this is only a small uh, portion. So in conclusion, um, 
we learned that uh, uh, when the official link is present, uh, uh, one in 40 uh, pages has a click on it. Uh, the official uh, links uh, associated with uh, business, education, and sport have the highest click to rate. And some articles act as a stepping stone to the actual destination. And uh, uh, finally, uh, the economic value of uh, web uh, traffic offered by Wikipedia English for free can be estimated in the order of many million per month. And uh, um, we learn uh, basically in, with this project that uh, in addition to the well-recognized uh, role uh, uh, of Wikipedia as a free knowledge provider, Wikipedia provide also an additional value in helping users uh, uh, navigating the web and helping the website owner in receiving incoming traffic. Thank you for attention. And uh, if you want more technical details, uh, you, you can find our paper uh, with uh, a lot more. Uh, if there are, Thank you, Tizian. Happy to. Oh, sorry. Thank you very much, Tiziano, for this great presentation um, we have. Thanks for staying on time. So uh, we have plenty of time for questions. If anyone in the room here wants to go ahead. Well, I can pass on uh, the first one from YouTube, uh, which Tiziano is about the broken links and how you handled that. And I know from past work, you've got a lot of experience dealing with all the different types of links that show up on pages. And so I'd be curious, or uh, if you'd be willing to kind of discuss, yeah, like what percentage of links are broken and like, how do you, how does this handled? And yeah, just all those kind of finer details around links on Wikipedia. Is there not links in particular? Um, so uh, how many are broken? Uh, I don't have the, the, the answer. Um, it's, uh, I, I can say that it's not so easy to detect uh, how many are broken because uh, I, at some point I try for another project to detect it, but uh, um, sometimes the domain uh, is, uh, um, if you check the destination, uh, you get a uh, 200 reply. It looks like uh, it's a legit reply, but the, the domain is spare and it was acquired by someone else. And you get that, that um, kind of page from, um, I don't know, the, um, the popular uh, domain uh, provider saying that this page is uh, available by it now. So it's, uh, it's not so obvious only by looking at the uh, metadata. Uh, I think it's an open problem to detect uh, broken links. And um, for uh, other, uh, other thing about uh, external links, uh, um, I can say that um, for other project, we, we realized that um, is not uh, enough to use the um, wiki code, um, especially because uh, many templates are not uh, uh, expanded in the wiki code. So at the end, uh, if you really want to get the full uh, representation of external links, you have to get the final version HTML. And, uh, and this is what we have to do. Like, um, for example, uh, there are templates uh, that add uh, uh, the geolocation but this is um, only available in the HTML. So it is um, uh, 60 million links that I described are uh, obtained from the HTML. Okay, there are other questions maybe. Uh, 
I can keep going with some of the community questions. So this one's coming from YouTube. And the question is, uh, how do you think about whether your results should change how editors think about the use of links and info boxes? Should there be more links, less links, more vetting? Just if you have any thoughts on how editors uh, might interpret these results. Good question. Um... So uh, I think the, the real problem is in uh, the reference uh, where we saw that um, um, our, uh, external links are not used. Uh, I mean, it's used, but 0.03% is very little. So probably um, on the editor side, uh, um, it's not a matter of editor. It's more, uh, in my opinion, it, there should be some uh, study in um, the direction of how can we give more value to references? How can we engage a reader in uh, um, checking the source of the information? So I think it's a broader problem, uh, not uh, only from the editor uh, perspective. Yeah, I don't have a <laughs> that's an easy answer for uh, the editor. Yeah, and I, I don't think there is an easy answer to it. I think it depends a lot on, yeah, it just depends a lot on the goals and what the, what the value of those links are, the intended value of those links are. Yeah. Um, uh, another one, actually, I meant to do this from the start, but the first question came from Pooja G from YouTube about the broken links, and the second one came from Suriname Zero on YouTube. Um, this third one comes from Netrom from IRC, um, and it says, this only studied English Wikipedia. Do you have thoughts on the impact of other language editions? If you've done this study in, in other language editions, how it might have generalized? Or... No, uh, unfortunately not, because... Um, um... Collecting this data, it's um, resource intensive and uh, it's um, first resource intensive and then it has to be well motivated. So we uh, only work with uh, English. Maybe in the future we will extend to other uh, languages. It's uh, for now, we don't have this, uh, this data. I can say that there are differences uh, location based in the English uh, edition. And uh, um, um, for example, uh, what I notice uh, is that this uh, access to website for um, bypass paywalls is more uh, um, evident in the countries um, less developed, where probably their university don't have a uh, possibility to have access to the, all the publisher. So the, if uh, you uh, plotted a breakdown by country of this uh, high click to rate uh, website, you see clearly that the uh, US is smaller and uh, other countries uh, fill uh, the large portion. Okay. And if I'm interpolating from your results to write the shorter articles uh, had higher click through rate, correct? Um, so in language editions that had kind of more stub articles and things like that, we would probably expect higher click-through rate to some of the external sites. Is that fair to say? Yeah, we observed this in uh, interreferences, that uh, there is this effect uh, that uh, people click more if the article is short. Uh, and our hypothesis is that uh, the article doesn't fulfill the information need of uh, the reader, so the reader is... Um, almost forced to um, search for external content. And the uh, uh, hypothesis uh, is, uh, so if uh, editors add more content, people click less on the external, uh, external clicks. Um, but this is valid for references. We didn't investigate uh, um, this relation with uh, uh, official links uh, or uh, other type of links in the page. Anyone else from the room? I have one really quick question. 
Yeah. Um, yeah so I was really struck by the slide of the uh, external to Wikipedia to external. Um, and I, I just hadn't really thought deeply about that yet. And uh, in my in, in my talk in, you know, very shortly, I'm going to make the argument that uh, that I think that for a lot of queries, if, if people wanted to, like, for instance, use Google less, and actually there's a lot of queries that they could just go to Wikipedia and use Wikipedia's search directly. Um, and I'll talk more about that in a little bit. Uh, but I guess I'm curious, did those results, do you interpret that as kind of people are using Wikipedia as this maybe like two-step search engine? People want to get to, to a website and they're going Google, Wikipedia, actual website, where the, the basically the work of the Wikipedia editors is uh, replacing like an algorithmic search engine in this context. Does, does that kind of make sense? Or do you interpret it that way as well? Yeah, uh, we, as I said, we interpreted it as um, Wikipedia for some type of content is a stepping stone to the actual destination. So in, in some sense, yes, uh, what you said, it's, um, I, mean, I agree with, with what you said. Um, it basically replaced the search engine doing the work of the search engine when uh, it cannot really provide for different reasons. Could be uh, legal. Mm -hmm. the, the search engine decided uh, to remove uh, um, the entry or uh, simply is not indexed or uh, this kind of... Uh, and we notice, I, I, I can add a, a side comment. We notice also um, that uh, by inspecting uh, uh, the result of uh, Google from different countries, you get very different uh, results. So in some cases, Wikipedia is the first and uh, uh, the actual website is not even there. And some cases in reverted. So uh, we notice that, um, Let's say, okay, some country um, have strict regulation on file sharing. So in that case, uh, you search uh, with a VPN from that country, you don't find that website in the first page of the search uh, result. And Wikipedia is the first one. And people do this uh, two-step uh, jump. Cool, thanks. Uh oh, that's that's also jumping straight to my limitations section. <laughs> what a great uh, transition to next talk. I think. Thanks a lot, Tiziano. For I think if there's more question coming up uh, in the meantime, we can we can revisit them after Nick's talk. But uh, thanks a lot, Tiziano and Nick. Go ahead, please, with the talk. Unmute myself, make sure I'm in the speaker view. How does my slides look? Very good. Okay, cool. Um, so I'll just jump right in. So hi everyone, I'm Nick. I'm a PhD student at Northwestern in the People, Space and Algorithms Research Group. And so I'm gonna be presenting work that I did with my advisor, Brent Hecht, uh, looking at the importance of Wikipedia links to search engines. And so a bit on the structure. So I'm gonna first describe a specific study about, about search engine result pages or SERPs on Wikipedia. And this is a paper that we're going to be presenting at CSCW 2021. And if you're at Wiki Workshop 2020, it may sound familiar because this is the same data. We've just expanded the paper quite a bit and, and writ, wrote a lot more uh, discussion and interpretation. Um, and so with that in mind, I'm, I'm also going to go a bit fast on the methods. Uh, so I apologize for that. But if you're interested and you want to do SERP scraping, definitely just follow up uh, or you know check out the paper or, or ping me. And I'd, I'd love to talk about it. Uh, and then I want to use the second half to talk a little bit about connecting what we observed in the search engine results to the many other examples of Wikipedia fueling uh, AI, machine learning, data science, what have you. Uh, sometimes what we call just intelligent computing systems uh, more broadly. So with that, I'll jump right in. So starting with the underlying motivation uh, for this particular paper and, and some of the other research we've done around here. So there's this huge research interest uh, in intelligent technologies and machine learning. And so researchers have highlighted many benefits of intelligent technologies, obviously. So there's saving people money, making companies money, uh, providing better services to people. And then in the case of Wikimedia, for instance, helping peer production with tools like ORS. Um, on the other hand, there's a growing body of research which is highlighting the downsides, uh, privacy concerns, exacerbated econ economic inequality, uh, basically the accumulation of power more generally and, and harms to, to groups that are not in power. Um, and so the discussion around these technologies has often in the media focused on algorithms and platforms, 
uh, you know, there's kind of this narrative of focusing on the on the computer scientists and their their new optimizing algorithm or their new approach for their clever new way to do gradient descent. But another critical component is what uh, some others have called data labor, uh, or the activities that just everyday people engage in, which creates the data that fuels intelligent technologies. So why study data labor? Uh, so for one, one reason is that the economic concerns about intelligent technologies are very high stakes. Uh, and beyond the economic issues, studying data labor can change how we think about it. So this relates to the sustainability of peer production. Um, and at a high level, by making people aware of the value of data labor, it's possible for the data laborers to leverage this value and, and change the relationships, change the power dynamics. This could mean getting a, a paycheck in some cases, probably not in the case of Wikipedia. Uh, Wikipedians are not going to get paid uh, for editing, but it might mean other things like recognition, agency, or other forms of support for Wikipedia. When I originally made this slide, Wikipedia Enterprise had not been announced yet. I'm going to come back to that at the end. I'm super excited, and it's very, very relevant uh, to this whole research area. So how exactly do Wikipedia and search engines fit into this data labor uh, concept? So search engines really widely used, influential, you know, Google's a verb. I, I guess that's kind of a, a, a overused example now, but I'll use it anyway. And search engines are relying on two types of training data. So your actual clicks, what you clicked on, as well as the actual content, the, the results that they serve. These are both critical or else the, the technology does not function. Uh, and so back in 2017, McMahon et al., uh, including Isaac, uh, who was who just speaking, uh, performed a browser extension experiment. And they found that when they removed Wikipedia links from Google search results, the folks who participated in the experiments basically dropped their click-through rate drastically. Um, and I should point out, this was a study that was motivated by a call from the Wikimedia Foundation to study reuse. So of course, people had been aware, aware of this relationship for a long time. Um, so then I actually have led a follow-up study where we collected search engine results pages using a scraper or, or SERPs, that's what I'm going to say for the rest of this, the talk. Um, and we basically found that Wikipedia was really, really prevalent with the caveats that it wasn't prevalent in every single category of queries we considered, and it's not always in the top three results. Um, so the takeaway is that Wikipedia, it seems like from these two studies at least and, and other related work that Wikipedia is one of the most important sources of results for search engines. Uh, so along this research trajectory, we had several uh, generalization questions. So, okay, what about search engines other than just Google? Even though Google you know, has this really dominant market share, uh, it, it's an open question if the results generalized. And then also, what about mobile results? So uh, scraping mobile can be a bit harder, and there's more and more people basically making searches for mobile every year. Uh, so it seems like an important context to consider. And then there's this technical challenge, which is, on one hand, how do we handle the fact that search engines, that SERPs, uh, change all the time? Uh, and also that they're basically not really just 10 blue links anymore. Uh, so here's some examples of, um, of SERP elements, as they've been called. So there's a knowledge box here of Munich a news carousel showing a bunch of news stories, a Twitter carousel showing tweets, uh, and presumably these things show up all the time, so they must be important uh, to the search engine companies. So how do we do it? What's the methods? Uh, so first off, three really important things to select is which search engines will we look at? Which devices will we try to emulate to look at? I'll just say yes, yeah, so we basically emulated devices using software, more on that in a minute. And then also most importantly of all is which queries will we investigate? This is so important because of course, you can basically really skew the results of any search audit if you just kind of hand pick queries that you know will um, do it. So in the case of if you wanna see how much Wikipedia shows up, imagine that I append Wikipedia to every query I make. Of course, Wikipedia will show up in every page and it'll probably be the first result. Uh, so it's important to kind of, you know, argue for a principled and fair way of selecting queries or else the results just aren't very interesting. Okay, so for query selection, we basically pick three categories that we believe to be important because they're made a lot. So a lot of people saw these SERPs uh, or they're and or they're important because they kind of have a outsized impact on how people might act. So the three queries, the query categories we used are common queries, which we got from arefs.com. This is a company that tries to estimate, um, you know, what people are searching for basically. And this is a lot of like very navigational stuff. So like Facebook, I think is the top one. People going to Facebook via Google. Um, the second was trending queries because these are these are going to be actually topics. Uh, so we got 282 total from Google Trends in 2019. And then finally, medical queries. There's actually some prior research that collaborated with Bing, and Bing shared the uh, the top, the most frequent uh, medical queries that are made to its search engine. So we used 50 of those as well. Uh, for data collection, so we used our approach was to use Puppeteer, which is a Node.js software that runs headless Chrome. And so to start with, we forked uh, this amazing SE scraper library from a uh, GitHub user Nikolai T, and we basically uh, modified it a bit so that we could focus on recording and analyzing link coordinates within the space of a single SERP. Um, so the old or like the classic approach for SERP scraping is that you collect HTML with a, with a script and a researcher will sit down and literally read the HTML line by line 
and then write some CSS rules to parse the HTML page into a ranked list. So you kind of write code that says, you know, for all the elements with this class, we'll treat them as if they are a news carousel or a blue link or, or something like that. Um, but how are we going to do that? It's kind of tough to do that with uh, SERPs that look like this. It's not impossible. And I will talk about some more recently updated SERP software, not for me, that does a good job of this that I, I really recommend if you're interested. But um, we wanted to try an alternate approach. So that's this is just a zoomed in shot of that same, you know, NDA SERP, which has, uh, you know, it's just wild. It's not 10 blue links at all. It's nothing like 10 blue links. Uh, so our approach is spatial analysis. So getting link coordinates. So basically it's really simple, actually. We just take the, the HTML, we get all of the A elements, all of the link elements in the page, and then calculate their position uh, using this uh, get bounding client rect function uh, with respect to the space of the perp. So every single link has an X, Y coordinate. Uh, and so a quick note, if you want to collect today, so I actually, after we wrote the first draft of this paper, I created a minimal script for doing the link coordinates. So SE Scraper has a bunch of bells and whistles, but we didn't actually need them all. So this is kind of like a, you know, just from the ground up, it's like a single, a single JavaScript file, uh, which if you're curious, it, it's like, could be a bit easier to read if you want to check that out. Um, and then also, if you want to study Google with a ranked list approach, I suggest this web searcher software uh, from Ronald Robertson at Northeastern. This is really great and actually has really good localization support, which my, uh, the software that we use does not have. Uh, so that's one of the big weaknesses. I'll get back to that. Uh, but this uh, ranked approach does, or sorry, web searcher does. So to study the SERPs, we define this thing called a spatial instance rate. And so basically the idea is first, we're going to see, does Wikipedia show up on the page at all? That's the full page instance rate. But then we also want to know, does Wikipedia appear above the fold, for instance, kind of the area where you don't have to, to scroll, a more prominent part of the SERP? Um, and maybe is Wikipedia showing up on the left-hand side or the right-hand side? Uh, this is particularly relevant because lots of prior work has noted that the knowledge panel is really, really chock full of Wikipedia links in particular. Um, so basically, we have this full page instance rate. So just uh, to kind of spell it out, if we collect three SERPs and Wikipedia appears in two of them, that's an instance rate of two thirds. And then if Wikipedia only appears above the fold in one of them, that's an above the fold instance rate of one third. Um, also, so data validation is really tough here. So SERP, SERPs like change all the time. Uh, this is another reason that the spatial approach is kind of nice because there's no hard-coded CSS rules. Um, so the basic approach is we saved a screenshot of every SERP that we collected. And then what we can do is we can visualize the analysis ready data so that the JSON data, which is just links and their coordinates and try to make sure that they align. So what that looks like is I actually created this kind of data visualization of a SERP just from the links. So that's on the, this is like this, you know, big mess over here. I highlighted all the Wikipedia links in green. Um, and then I actually look at the screenshot of the SERP and try to make sure that the, the Wikipedia link that appears in my quantitative representation in the grid uh, looks like it as a human would see the SERP. Uh, okay, so some results. So looking at the desktop full page incidence rates across categories, oh, there's a lot there. Um, yeah, sorry, let me slow down. So this is showing the full page incidence rates uh, on desktop on one side and on mobile in the other uh, for all three search engines we looked at and for all three categories that we looked at. So we saw that Wikipedia links were present in a lot, 70 to 80 percent of common and trending SERPs, but much less frequency, much less frequently in medical SERPs. Um, and for these queries, only DuckDuckGo was actually using Wikipedia for a high percentage of medical queries. And then basically comparing full page uh, desktop to mobile here, so left to right, uh, the results are pretty similar. So the full page incidence rates, basically the full page SERP for desktop and mobile were pretty similar. So next, looking at above the fold incidence rate, so that's the top no scroll required part. We saw the desktop results are, are pretty similar. So in other words, when Wikipedia links appear, they are appearing high up. On mobile, that's not true though. So this suggests a pretty large material difference between the desktop and mobile experience. Desktop users are a lot more likely to see Wikipedia articles, uh, which is of course a function of screen size, but um, it, it is it's important to note for sure. So then finally, comparing the left-hand and the right-hand rates, we saw that the right-hand instance rates were, uh, we're actually pretty close to the left hand. And in some cases, they're a little bit lower. So for instance, uh, looking at the medical queries, they're a little lower. Um, but in other cases, even higher. So for instance, looking at the common queries, the right hand instance rate was a lot higher. Um, so this means that for sure, Wikipedia's prevalence in SERPs was being driven by knowledge panel style elements. I should note that all three of these search engines have a knowledge panel style element. They're all really similar. And what I actually did is I defined to, to define this right hand instance rate. I just manually went in and counted the pixels such that I could draw a vertical line that would include the knowledge panel for all three search engines. So a funny part of the research process, but um, that, that's how we kind of made sure to capture all three of the slightly differently sized uh, knowledge panels. So basically, sorry, just going back to what this result means, it means that knowledge panel elements are driving a lot of the Wikipedia prevalence in SERPs, uh, but it's not the only one. And I should note one more time that again, these incidence rates are really, really crazy. If Wikipedia was a company trying to do SEO, uh, they would be you know, dominating, blowing everyone else out of the park. These are just insanely high incidence rates for a single domain. 
Um, okay, so summarizing the findings, so using this easy to understand uh, with some limitations measure, measure of incidence rates and spatial incidence rates, we saw that Wikipedia's importance to the success of search engine results extends beyond Google and extends beyond desktop, although with the caveat that when you go to mobile, you're less likely to see Wikipedia. Um, but again, you're also less likely to see any one source because your screen is smaller. Uh, in terms of queries and devices, both of these things matter. So we saw, you know, above the fold more on desktop, and we saw that knowledge panels are definitely a key source, but not the only source. Okay, so three limitations. Uh, I mean, there's there's probably more, but three I'll talk about right now. So this is an audit study. Uh, so it's pretty, it's very, very small scale, right? We we picked, it's like 400 queries total, three search engines, two devices. Um, so it, it's small scale for sure. And what we'd want to do, the, the best way to kind of, you know, validate this would be to either get data from Google, uh, Bing or DuckDuckGo, probably not going to happen anytime soon, or data from Wikimedia Foundation, which I'm just so extraordinarily excited about the, uh, the little teaser that, that Isaac mentioned at the beginning that there's going to be some data. So I'm really, really excited to try to look at these results side by side with the actual search engine referral data and see what we can make of it. Uh, and if anyone's interested in kind of doing that collaboratively, trying to like write a, a quick blog post or something, uh, please reach out because I'm just like extremely pumped about this. Uh, okay. Secondly, this is our study like the previous one and like a ton of, this is, you know, a common uh, limitation section if you read a lot of Wikipedia research, um, but it's still US and, and EN Wikipedia only. Uh, and, and ultimately, like, there's no one to blame here but myself, which is that I, I did, uh, you know, it's just myself and one other author on this paper, and uh, I only speak English. And so I, I'm also really excited if anyone wants to try to, to collaborate to extend this to other languages. I think that would be, be really great, and I'm, I'm super open to that. Finally, again, queries matter immensely. So really, really easy to cheat and append Wikipedia to every query and say, hey, look, everyone, I, I conducted this audit, and I found that Wikipedia appears in 100% of search engine results. Isn't that interesting? Um, so anytime you read a search audit, you really have to in interpret it conditioned on the queries that were, were chosen, um, which is why we spent a lot of time debating and thinking about these queries. And uh, you can read the paper for a little bit more details about why, why we think uh, this small set of queries is, is actually uh, quite important to consider. Okay, so some discussion points. So first of all, uh, basically Wikipedia matters outside Wikipedia, and other folks have said this as well. And this kind of just uh, you know bolsters the message. On the positive side, this means that when peer production works well, it basically just makes search great. Uh, and this is kind of, Wikipedia is a public good. I think there's an argument to be made that even Google Google search is a public good. It's quite hard to exclude people from using it. Um, and so kind of as Wikipedians do good peer production, the, the whole world just benefits uh, and that's amplified by search. On the other hand, of course, when there are negative biases in coverage and quality of which uh, there are quite a few, which have been documented and, and there are ongoing efforts to resolve these as well, um, those will impact search results as well. And I, I'm not trying to say that it's Wikipedia's fault if Google SERPs are bad, that, that that's crazy. Uh, you know, Google search is a commercial product and, and Wikipedia is not. But overall, this does just generally raise the stakes of Wikipedia-focused research and findings. When a new finding comes out about how to do peer production better, this has kind of outsized impacts that are amplified by search. Um, and then there's this other point that data from the public is fueling intelligent technologies. So uh, are Wikipedia editors some of the most important employees of search engines? Uh, I think we think so, at least uh, Brent and I do, and, and many of our collaborators. Uh, and and this, this is an interesting thing to think about. And it, also there's this tough question, of, okay, so what do you do about it then? Again, we're not gonna pay, no one is ever gonna pay Wikipedia editors to make edit. That's just you know flagrantly against the, the way that Wikipedia works. Um, and so I'm, as this group is aware, it's a complicated issue. There's not an obvious solution. Um, Oh, yeah, I had a slide for that. You cannot pay people to head at Wikipedia. Nice. Uh, so things that you might be able to do uh, more prominently credit Wikipedia, credit individual contributors, maybe. Should, should Google be doing that? Should Bing be doing that? Uh, should these search platforms be working harder to solicit contributors to make it more obvious that if you read and you are maybe disagree slightly with the result, that you have the option to go in and edit or you know start up a debate on the talk page? Uh, these things are not necessarily super obvious in, in search engines right now. But they could be. And then finally, there's the donate to Wikimedia, Wikipedia or Wikipedia and or Wikimedia, uh, which actually the enterprise edition provides a really nice structured way to do so. And I'm, I'm really excited to see kind of what that future holds in particular. And now I want to talk a little bit about kind of two ways that Wikipedia is used. So the incidence results are mostly about how Wikipedia results are served by computing systems. But it's just the tip of the iceberg because Wikipedia also trains systems, uh, most prominently language models. So like GPT-3, you may have seen BERT, these big uh, massive systems are, are basically ingesting all of Wikipedia to learn how grammar works and how to write good sentences, et cetera. And so I've been kind of, uh, you know, doing this thought experiment that a useful metaphor here is Wikipedia as a meal versus Wikipedia as a recipe, which is obtained via surveillance of an open kitchen. Uh, because 
most Wikipedia editors write their article and they're probably very happy if it's at the top of Google search results and lots of folks are reading the article they spent lots of work on. They might think it's a little weird if to find out that basically these tech companies were kind of surveilling how they go about writing uh, you know, their particular language and, and using that as like a recipe for, for teaching machines, right? It's a, it's a little different here. Um, and so some other examples of this, so uh, in the Alexa voice assistant, uh, Wikipedia is really, really commonly used as a source to answer queries. Um, YouTube links directly to Wikipedia to fight conspiracy theories. Facebook is doing this now too. Uh, let's see, other ones. Oh yeah, other social platforms. So like on, on Stack Exchange and Reddit, we've done some research looking at how it's really common to use Wikipedia links to kind of add value to your post. And, and actually we've done some similar counterfactual analysis to try to understand what's the, the economic value of kind of using Wikipedia links to, to bolster engagement with uh, posts on these platforms like, like Reddit and Stack Exchange. Um, but then also, oh yeah, know some more. So actually just today, I, I just tweeted about this. I created a, a GitHub repository, it's just a markdown file. Uh, I'm totally keen to move this to like something that's a little easier, lower cost to add to. But I, I wanna try to make a roundup, kind of just a collection of, of these kind of examples. Um, and so I'll post this again at the end. Uh, but basically, yeah, check this out if you wanna read more. I, I think there's a lot there. Uh, and then on the Wikipedia as a recipe obtained via the surveillance of an open kitchen uh, kind of category, some examples include, so GPT-3 I mentioned already, um, reading Wikipedia to open answer open domain questions. These are both from really high profile groups. So it's OpenAI and, and Facebook. Um, and then actually here's a crazy one. So I, I think that saying that Wikipedia is important to NLP, totally uncontroversial, but this one kind of shocked me. I was reading the 2015 ImageNet uh, large scale visual recognition challenge paper. And they actually used uh, Wikipedia to help the labelers label the images. So. Not only is, is Wikipedia kind of like responsible for an enormous amount of natural language processing research, but it's actually leaked into perhaps the most important computer vision data set too. Um, this is just wow, this really blew my mind and I was excited to find this. Uh, I should also note not that, you know, obviously focusing on citations is not the most productive way to go about assigning importance in the world, uh, but all these papers I've mentioned are like really, really influential. So GPT-3, the Facebook's question answering system, uh, BERT, and ImageNet, these, these are all just like insanely influential within the scientific literature. So an open question, I think that one can make a pretty strong argument that Wikipedia is one of the most important resources for open machine learning research. Uh, do you think this has been acknowledged? Not enough, too much, just the right amount. Um, and then again, on the horizon, the Wikimedia Enterprise kind of offers a, a new way to go about mediating these relationships. And a fun blog post idea, I, I mean, I, I hope to do this someday, but if anyone wants to steal it or you know, borrow it, uh, totally do it. If Wikipedia were treated as a, uh, a collective scientific author entity, where would it rank in the machine learning canon? I think pretty high. Perhaps, you know, one of the Wikipedia is one of the most important machine learning scholars uh, of all time. And I'm also curious, I actually don't know how I would go about finding this, how the funding that tech companies give to uh, Wikipedia compared to the funding that they give to like superstar academics and technologists. Uh, I think this is, it could be an interesting way to frame it. Connecting back to that economic value question again. And cool, all right, my timer says I have five seconds left. So huge thanks. So uh, Brent Hecht is my, my PhD advisor and, and helped me to write this paper and other similar work in that area. Uh, thank you to the reviewers and the colleagues um, and all my colleagues who kind of gave feedback. We use a lot of open software here, of course. So the SE Scraper package and, and Puppeteer was really important. And then of course the whole NumPy, Panda, Seaborn, uh, SciPy ecosystem that are you know used in every paper and, and never cited. And I think I'm guilty of that as well in many cases. Uh, so there's my, I'll leave it on this slide for like a minute. Um, in case you want to visit any of these links or, or ping me with, with questions about that. And then, yeah, that's it. Thanks so much for listening. This was super fun. Wow, thanks so much, Nick. Thanks for the presentation. Lots of open questions. It's, it seems you raised to the audience than the other way around. Yes. But nevertheless, <laughs> I, <laughs> nevertheless, I'll try to turn it around if um, anyone wants to, to ask, probe more into into Nick's comments and results, please feel free. If anyone's from the room, but otherwise Isaac is mentioning there's already something from the audience. So maybe we start with that. Yeah, uh, thanks Nick. Lots of discussion going on about this and, and Tiziano's work too. So I encourage both of you if you get the chance to check out the, the comments because I'm really only passing on the questions. Um, but uh, this question came in from Trepar S on YouTube um, and they're curious about what strategies sites like Wikipedia could use. Uh, so I guess the uh, context, this was about your point 
about how people might feel okay with Wikipedia content showing up in search, but maybe not the kind of surveillance aspect of this is how we edit and like, training language models. And so they're curious, like, what do you have thoughts around strategies if people were concerned about that? Um, or just like, what do you do about that if that is a concern? Yeah, so one thing I'll add on that point, actually, that I, I guess I didn't make a good point about is that we've, one thing, one way that we've been trying to think about like, okay, so what can we do about it? Like, how can the, you know, how can the, the people here, be, the people being Wikipedians actually kind of gain some power or have a leg to stand on? Uh, especially because this is technically, well, it's generally, it's it's under the, the license, right? Like when, if a tech company wants to read all of Wikipedia to train a language model and then make a gazillion dollars off of that, they're within their rights to do so. Um, which, which kind of raises a challenge, which is what can you do there? So in another context, if, if that wasn't the case, uh, we, you might do what we call a data strike, which is where basically a group of people might like delete or withhold their data or demand that an organization not use it. Uh, and, and that just doesn't work as well in, in the Wikipedia case. Uh, but the nice thing is that basically by, by virtue of Wikipedia being so open is that basically anyone can do it. So at the very least, if there are competitors to the large tech company that you're upset with, the competitors can also uh, you know, do that same thing. So in fact, I think there's a kind of an anti-competitive argument to the fact that the more big technologies are Wikipedia dependent, that's actually good. Conditional on the fact that, the, uh, that there's not too much capital required so that there's not too expensive. So basically, let, let me put it this way, as uh, kind of data efficient and compute efficient uh, machine learning research advances, I would expect the large dependence on Wikipedia to, um, to actually help in, uh, you know, small startups and, and competitors to incumbents even more. To the point of like what could we do right now, I do think that, that like attempts to kind of publicize and, and kind of do these big economic estimates will create pressure for the companies to at least do a better job of acknowledging the work of the Wikipedians that they're really relying on. And then considering, you know, in doing something like at least signing up for Wikimedia Enterprise. Um, that being said, like at the end of the day, it, it is kind of a, it, it's a really unique case wherein no one, I am not advocating, I don't think anyone is advocating for, for instance, like trying to vandalize Wikipedia as a way to get back at Google. That's like, no, no one wants that at all, right? That's just ultimately a, a public bad or, you know, the reduction of a public good. Um, and so it's probably going to be through kind of regulation and these more organization to organization relationships, stuff like the enterprise, um, that I think the, the situation could be improved. Thanks. No, that was, I think, uh, brought a lot more kind of detail to that, that point. Um, and it is a really interesting one to kind of to ponder. Um, the second question comes from IRC and it's coming from Suriname Zero. Um, and they're asking about the medical result thing uh, in particular and, and what you think is going on there. And the comment was also made by Netron um, that medical content actually is like, there's been a lot of organized work by Wikipedia editors to make this content really high quality. So there's a kind of odd tension there between it's ranked lower on search, but it's actually content that really has a lot of curation and like work that has gone into it and just your thoughts about what's going on there. Yes. So I remember getting a little bit of pushback, I think, in early drafts for being too speculative on this topic. So my impression just from having, you know, visually examined all of the medical SERPs that we collected is that there is some kind that the search engines, at least Google and Bing, are doing some kind of topic classification and they are sending it, these queries down a separate pipeline. You can try it right now, you know, try search NBA and then search, um, uh, I, I don't know, irritable bowel syndrome, or I forget what my examples were, you know, headache, congestion. Um, these things basically have their own, it's, it's different. It's they're actually colored differently. They're like this nice, like blue color, very aesthetic, actually. Uh, they have their own knowledge panel, which typically it, it seems to me to only draw on sources that are a, um, uh, you know, from kind of a, an allow list. So it's like WebMD, Mayo Clinic, uh, things like that. I, I actually, I mean, I, I suppose I could look at the data and probably get that reverse engineer, the allow list. Um, but right, it's really weird because actually some of the early work on search auditing in Wikipedia was looking at, at what kind of Wikipedia articles were showing up in medical queries. And there is all this work on, on structured, uh, you know, kind of doing structured using Wikipedia's medical um, articles as, as structured data for imp improving like, a, there's a really cool paper. It's actually in, I just put it in the Wikimedia, the, the roundup, sorry, the Wikipedia value roundup that I shared, um, which is using it to using Wikipedia to train a system that tries to kind of like annotate clinical notes. 
Um, it's like it's like the, the technical details of that paper are really cool. Um, but yeah, basically, it seems like the search designers kind of just made a decision that like we are too worried. We don't want you know this is a special case, and it shows, of course, that the search engine designers can intervene. Uh, you know, sometimes they'll just say, you know, it's the algorithm or, oh, we just, we're learning to rank on clicks. And so, you know, we, we can't be too blamed for what our results look like, but clearly there's cases where, where they will intervene and kind of create this, this special pipeline. Um, and I, I'm not sure necessarily if that, like, if it, what's, what's better or like kind of what is in the interest of Wikipedia, what's in the interest of the search users. I, I think that's definitely an open debate that I, I won't comment on. <laughs> Maybe a quick question as a follow-up. Did you try to explore other topics beyond the uh, medical content, like uh, movies or? Yeah, so we haven't yet. So we, we actually, we had more categories in the older mm -hmm. work and we wanted to cut it down a little bit for this one because we are doing, basically the, the most laborious aspect of all of this work is actually just manually doing that, the alignment step because it's like, it's quite easy to, um, you know, have, have bugs, like so these search engine results pages. I don't know if it has, anyone has read the raw HTML for a SERP lately, but they're just the most nightmarish, uh, you know, thing you could possibly imagine. It's, it's the complete opposite of a human readable document. And it's a uh, truly miraculous that our browser can turn that into, uh, to, into something we can read, uh, you know, really a, a modern marvel of engineering or, you know, a modern marvel of, of solving problems that humans themselves created. <laughs> but I don't have data for recently. We are, I, I kind of have some ongoing projects looking at, at other topics right now, but I don't like have a great, uh, kind of like a nice like analysis notebook or anything like that to share off the top of my head, unfortunately, yeah. But if you're interested, uh, definitely check uh, any of the softwares out. It's actually, it's, it's super easy nowadays. You can really just kind of, you know, clone, clone a Git repo and be, be SERP scraping. Um, you know, following the rate limits, I should say, you know, we're, we're, we're pretty careful. We try to do these pretty slow and take our time on these so that we're not uh, violating, you know, being, being bad, bad custodians. Uh, and of course, in the case of this research project, technically I, I did actually kind of like manually look at every result. Um, so, you know, that, that kind of slows it down as well too. <laughs> I have a quick technical question about the uh, search scraping in terms of how much to I mean, there's always this question about how the search, how this is in other wikis, other countries, other languages, and so on. But how is it, how does customization of search results affecting these results? If these were the results presented to you, I don't know how much, how much do they vary from, let's say, because your browser history has that stuff. And yeah, that's a really good any. question. So that, that definitely will matter for sure. And there's like a lot of, a lot of the early search audit work was actually really focused on this question. And there's basically, there's some interesting findings. Uh, I mean, I, there are, I think they're all in the related work uh, that you can find that basically the big, the most important thing that really will screw up your personalization is localization. Um, but that mostly applies to local queries. So it's, it's restaurants near me, right? If we all do restaurants near me right now, we'll all get a completely different SERP. Probably actually, I don't know where you all are, but, but I, I'd bet money on it at least. Um, Whereas for something like Facebook, uh, like a query where it, like Facebook, which is what um, the, the search intent scholars would call a navigational query, there's like a really high chance that someone searching Facebook is trying to go to facebook.com and not trying to learn about the, the history of Facebook. Although some, some people certainly are. Um, there's also kind of this interesting point that, that because Wikipedia is so prevalent that folks uh, trying to just go to Facebook might see the Wikipedia link and end up deciding to read about the history of Facebook, which is kind of like a, a funny unintended consequence of these, of, of the fact that search engines have kind of stopped doing vertical search and, and are really focused on trying to answer all of your possible intents at once with this giant, you know, gazillion like widgets here, 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 here. Um, that being said, so I, I don't think that for the queries that we selected, that personalization would have a large effect. Certainly it would, and it would be really nice. I, I think the best way, uh, something I've seen, I think again, the folks at Northeastern have done for some of their search audience is uh, for some of their search audits is to do crowdsourced search auditing. So instead of you running a scraper, they will ask folks to download a browser extension. The browser extension says, hey, I'm gonna collect all your uh, data you know, for a week and it's only gonna be used for research study and you'll get paid. And so people will do this and they'll sign up and they'll share it. And uh, that is like the most ecologically valid thing to do. Uh, overall though, I don't expect that any of our, any of the specific like effect sizes that we reported in this paper will be overly affected by, by that because they're not local queries. Um, and local queries are, are the most vulnerable to personalization. Not the only one, definitely other stuff is personalized too, 
Uh, and this is also another thing that really uh, would be requires data collection over time as well, because the, you know, the personalization could really change uh, on a week by week basis, and they're not going to announce that. So it's quite hard to, uh, to try to reverse engineer that. that that's like a, a big challenge. But yeah, thanks for the question. Pablo, I see your hand. Thanks, Nick, for the answer. Yeah. Okay, so thanks, Nick, uh, for the talk and also Tiziano for your presentation. Like this is a very stimulating session. Uh, I have a question to both of you. So, in the area of disinformation, uh, some voices have claimed that part of the origin of this huge problem of the web ecosystem is the decision of um, the monetization of the internet uh, with clicks. So the moment that the internet started to be monetized with clicks, like we start using, uh, or some providers start using metrics based on clicks that were the ones that finally get concerned uh, for optimization and directly or indirectly, they fuel the proliferation of this information because they were truly effective in creating clicks. So there is, there is some connection between using click metrics and the emergence and the rise of misinformation in the web ecosystem. So in the specific context of uh, Wikipedia, where knowledge is free, and I mean free, like free of speech, not like free beer, uh, knowledge is created by volunteers, and the infrastructure is sustained by a non-profit. Uh, in your opinion, what are the risks of giving a prize to Wikipedia content or Wikipedia activity? You want to go first, uh, Tiziana? Or... <laughs> Please. <sir. laughs> All right. Um, yeah. So I have some thoughts on this. So I think that that ideally, right, it, it would be um, that if if we could sustain, you know, without having to give the price, it, it would be great. But like, so the the biggest evidence, like, or like the evidence why I think that at least trying to put some price on it is warranted, is like for it, in the example of knowledge panels with no attribution, I, I'm fairly certain, and someone can correct me if I'm wrong, that there was a long period of time when the knowledge panels took paragraphs straight from Wikipedia, never attributed to that. And that actually didn't change until the Wikimedia Foundation started calling for research on reuse. And, and I, I, I think that Isaac was the 2017 paper actually kind of like influential in, in making that change. Do, do you know? I guess we can't know for sure, but um, I, I, I think that, you know, this wasn't brought to light until it was framed uh, in this light. And so, one, I guess one thing that I would say is that I would love to uh, see a, like opportunities for, for like things like Wikimedia Enterprise is I think is a promising way that tries to really thread the needle between acknowledging that, you know, we like Wikipedia needs, has certain needs that are like economic in a sense. So like in the, the economy of readers and editors, right? They, they need attribution. Uh, if, if everyone started reusing Wikipedia with no attribution, that, that could be deadly. Uh, so that, that's like kind of an unacceptable outcome that you need to kind of navigate these power dynamics. Like at some point, someone needs to make demands and say, hey, you, you need to stop doing this. Uh, it's probably not effective to just assume that every tech company will out of the good of their heart think like, uh-oh, we might be kind of, you know, poisoning poisoning the commons here, you know, throwing throwing the poison in the local well, so to speak, um, to solve it. A really interesting point. So I was just rereading. I, I also tweeted about this. I was rereading the, the ORS paper um, from... Aaron Hopfakira and Stuart Geiger. And they make this, this really interesting point in there, which is that basically that ORS is, is really good and it offers this great alternative for like kind of a community participatory machine learning system. Um, but the ultimate way for it to actually be fair, like for, to achieve kind of its true goal, you would wanna have like uh, leisure time distributed equally amongst everyone in the world. Uh, and and that, that is not, you know, the case right now. And so without, without acknowledging, uh, there, this is kind of an argument from uh, feminist e economics that without acknowledging and making some effort to measure the economic value of, of work that's been previously, you know, kind of made invisible and, and ignored, it, it's, it's not really possible to, uh, you know, act on those power relationships to change those power relationships. And so a resource that I think makes this argument a lot better than me is, uh, is the Data Feminism book, uh, which, which talks about this a lot. And I think the arguments that they lay out there actually have a really kind of cogent response to this question of like how to navigate something like Wikipedia where lots of people are doing uh, kind of labor for free, but also exist in this kind of like very unequal distribution of, of leisure time and of money and of access to the resources. And 
yeah, I'll just say again that I'm hopeful. I, like, I think Wikimedia Enterprise is a pretty nice pioneer into trying out something a little different that, that could work well. I mean, I, you know, who knows how it's going to work, but I'm pretty hopeful for it. All right, sorry, that was way too long of an answer. <laughs> My apologies. Oh, no, thank you. Yeah, I, I don't, I think he said, uh, Nick said uh, really everything uh, there was to say. Maybe Leila had a question. You know, I just wanted to also comment on Pablo's question. Uh, good question. And if you're watching this, I encourage you to check out Wikimedia Research IRC channel on Freenode. There's also some discussion about uh, a similar topic there. Uh, I'll say the risk for uh, looking at the value of, the, of Wikipedia from the price point perspective is if we boil down the value and to only the price value. Right, and the economic value. I think the risk is if the conversation shifts to what is the economic value and we forget about all the other values that Wikipedia brings in terms of empowering people to participate, to engage, to share in the sum of all knowledge, which are important and perhaps should be measured and more stories to be told, research stories to be told around them. So I would say that's the risk and to mitigate, uh, I generally encourage more research in the broader space of the value of Wikipedia. It can be from the reuse perspective, it can be from the price perspective, but it also can be in terms of, uh, Diego put a link uh, in, in IRC about like, what is the value of water, right? What are the values of essential commodities that we rely on and Wikipedia is one of them and it's not about just the price. Though the conversation around the price helps certain conversations, as Isaac mentioned in the framing, um, a lot of the copyright uh, conversations rely on the value of, the, of Wikipedia, the economic value of Wikipedia, simply because that's how the ecosystem is set up uh, in many businesses on the market. Yeah, could I have one more comment to add as well? Uh, which is that I, I think that one of the most, or like a way that I, I would like to see this line of research be be used in like the discussions between, you know, kind of like this, the decision makers at, at various big, big organizations um, is that this is kind of publicizing, uh, this is maybe an awkward way to put it, or maybe a little more confrontational than I'd like, but it's publicizing a threat. So ultimately what we're doing with this instance right here with the instance rate calculations is like a very kind of noisy and messy estimation of what Google already knows, right? They have very detailed logs as to, they can probably tell, you know, their uh, really great data scientists could offer really, you know, precise counterfactual estimations of like, here's how much worse off we'd be tomorrow if this resource went away, here's how much we'd be worse off if this resource went away, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? So they they know that like, for instance, if Wikipedia disappeared overnight or something like that, that, that search would, would, be, would be harmed to some degree, right? They know better than everyone else. And many of them may want to share it, but they can't because uh, they, you know there's there's reasons for which we need to keep lots of information proprietary uh, or you know under the current system and whatnot. Uh, but basically, by by conducting research on the topic, it kind of brings the the, the implied threat of like oh here's what would happen if that was gone um, into the public discussion, so that you can so that like more people can participate in that discussion. Uh, and and without that, I think that it's possible to kind of just know that, you know, oh, I, I'm really, really reliant on this particular thing. I'm really, really reliant on Wikipedia and, and just kind of coast on that forever. Um, so I think this is kind of framed, it, this might be framed in terms of like the collective action literature in, in terms of like a way of creating a sanctioning system. So it's really important, like, you know, you have a park and people, some people litter in the park and some people don't. And one way that, that parks stay clean is that, you know, the uh, people, other people in the park will see the people littering and wag their finger and shake their head and that's effective enough to get those people to stop littering. And this is like one of the reasons why we have public goods, even when the old economics papers say we shouldn't have any public goods. Everyone's rational. Why would anyone ever contribute to this? Why would you do it? Why wouldn't everyone just litter, right? But actually not everyone does litter. Um, I guess it depends on where you are, but in a lot of places, not everyone is littering. And bringing these numbers, these economic estimations to light, I think allows kind of a analogous sanctioning system to happen where then more people than just the kind of elite data scientists can, can try to talk about these effect sizes and uh, speculate as to, you know, kind of engage in a little bit of shaming maybe when, when an organization is, is using a, a public good in a way that's not sustainable. Thank you so much. I make a last call if there are any open 
questions? Give it a second or other comments to follow up. It's a switch, but I'll ask uh, the remaining question that was coming in from YouTube um, from Pooja S. And I, uh, Nick, you made a comment about you know coverage biases impacting uh, search results as well. And Pooja had asked about um, about. And actually, let me pull up the question. Yeah, um, whether you observed any particular biases in coverage and quality that impacted search results. And I guess I would add to that, like, do you have thoughts in general about how search engines either filter or magnify some of these coverage biases? Yeah, so just like a, a quick thought on this is that I, I think this is probably a separate study. So we didn't really see anything in our results. And this is, again, kind of speaks to the importance of query selection, where everything we selected is really, really uh, you know, is by definition, by the by the way that we selected it, like really high profile. And so uh, like an alternate interpretation of the really high Wikipedia incidence rate in the trending results is that, yeah, everything that went trending is, is high profile enough that it's like unambiguously meets the notability criteria for Wikipedia, right? Um, and so I think this could be a really cool uh, follow-up study. And I'm, I'm already thinking if there's ways to incorporate this with some of the, uh, you know, new data that, that you folks are gonna be sharing. Um, where I think there's a really great opportunity for search engines to try to work together with Wikipedia. If people are searching for a topic which is undercovered on Wikipedia, um, and that search engine is, is you know, well known to be very dependent on Wikipedia, there's a great opportunity to say, hey, here's a bunch of resources from other stuff we indexed. But also, by the way, here's this Wikipedia article that's actually really incomplete. And, and since you're searching for this topic, you might be interested in it and you could uh, you know, help to improve it. So I, I, I yeah, I, I don't know exactly what that feature would look like. And there might be, you know, some second order effects that I, I haven't thought of, and maybe that's a bad idea. But I think that at the very least, there's like a potentially a really big missed opportunity there to try to do some matching between, uh, you know, folks who'd be really well positioned to to address these things, but might not know they can, um, and the search engines, which are, which are reliant. So that's like a great example of something that I, I hope that conversation might come about by talking, like talking about these economic estimates, you know, I, I mean, if you really want, you could frame it in, you know, hey, Google, you can make even more money if you work together with Wikipedia to help direct, you know, folks who are experts in, you know, these, like this area of, of biographies that's undercovered. Um, and then you'll make Wikipedia better, but then your search engine will be even better too. It wouldn't that be great? Everyone will go home happy, uh, that kind of thing. So to the actual question though, I think that that's a separate study that I haven't done yet. So um, yeah, just to, to be totally honest on that front. Last comments at this point. Checking here now, I don't see anything here. Isaac was there. Did we cover everything from the chat? Okay, I think we're also quite over time, but there was a really engaging discussion. Thanks for this. This was super engaging. Thanks for the speakers foremost. Thanks for the great presentations and engaging with all the questions. And thanks everyone else for chiming in and joining the, the discussion, people in the room here, but also in the audience. I think I'll go back, check all the points that were raised, many different uh, angles that came up and maybe more questions than, than answers that are remaining. Uh, thanks Isaac for taking the questions. I also want to thank uh, Emerald here for the, who's also with us in the room for the tech support to make this happen, the live stream, and for Jana who uh, assisted in uh, the administrative component in organizing this. And uh, for the speakers, if you want to hang around for a minute longer after the stream uh, ends, I'm happy to, to continue talking. This is really interesting. And for the rest, uh, I hope to hope you enjoyed it. I hope you can join the next showcase next month in today, May, June. This will be June. Uh, that will be interesting too, I hope. And I wish you all the best uh, and a good rest of your day or start of your day, wherever you are. Bye-bye. <laughs>